started my real estate journey as a teacher, kind of buying a couple single family houses, renting those, which uh, renting out those. And after five years, I quote unquote retired from teaching in search of just a little bit more of a financial backing. And so began kind of a real estate entrepreneurship journey along with the daytime job, which is being an insurance agent. So that's the day job. And then just kind of do my own hobbies and side hustles for fun on the side. So I coach a varsity boys basketball team. And then I have my own podcast that I do. So I, I kind of have my hand in a few cookie jars, but that's kind of where I got, how I got to where I got to today. But when COVID hit, that was the last year of teaching. And I started getting, getting into all sorts of Zoom real estate meetups and just networking like crazy. Welcome to the Real Estate Hustlers Podcast, where we have interviews with real estate investors and entrepreneurs about successes, failures, and hard-earned lessons. Through in-depth conversations, one-on-one -on -one listener coaching calls, and news analysis, you'll get a breakdown of real strategies that work for different niches and experience levels. Tune in to the number one real estate investing podcast every week to stay in the know. Now, here is your host, Josh Appleman. All right. Welcome to Real Estate Hustlers Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Appleman, founder and CEO of Appleman Capital. Today, we're joined with Stuart Berryhill. Stuart is an entrepreneur with a passion for teaching financial literacy to young people. He's invested in over 270 units in Southeast and hosts the Money Vision U podcast, focusing on financial education. Stuart, we appreciate you coming on the show today. If you could let the listeners know a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I uh, love being guests on podcasts. I went to college, did that thing, and then I was a teacher and a high school coach uh, outside of after college. So I did that for five years, and the money just wasn't cutting it for that. I loved it, love kids, still have a passion for teaching financial literacy, and so I kind of got my feet wet with that. I, even though I wasn't making money, I wouldn't trade the experience for the world because I learned a lot, was thrust into, into some leadership positions, which has helped me a lot. But I started my real estate journey as a teacher, kind of buying a couple single family houses, renting those, which uh, renting out those. And after five years, I quote unquote retired from teaching in search of just a little bit more of a financial backing. And so began kind of a real estate entrepreneurship journey along with the daytime job, which is being an insurance agent. So that's the day job. And then just kind of do my own hobbies and side hustles for fun on the side. So I coach a varsity boys basketball team and then I have my own podcast that I do. So I, I kind of have my hand in a few cookie jars, but that's kind of where I got, how I got to where I got to today. But when COVID hit, that was the last year of teaching. And I started getting, getting into all sorts of Zoom real estate meetups and just networking like crazy. I mean, like once a day on top of just listening to a couple hours worth of podcasts per day, I was just all in. And so yeah. got connected to people that way. And that really helped, you know, speed up some of the real estate journey that I was doing and finding different partners for different units. And, and me and my brother, we, we 50, 50, uh, a few of our properties, but then we have some other joint venture deals as well. But that's, that's a brief background on how I got to where I am today, I guess. Oh, very cool. And it's to grit the hustle and the, uh, the drive to, to grow and, and uh, get further down the road. Uh, so today are you, you're currently invested into 270 units. Is that correct? Yes. One actually just sold, uh, 127 actually just sold. And then we have, and then I have another one. I'm, um, a, a part GPN and just helped raise capital and whatnot. Uh, but then we have 62 units specifically in the central Arkansas that I very much have kind of a heavy hand in of the asset management and 20 of those are Airbnb short-term rental type of properties. So we've kind of tinkered with different areas. But yeah, so we, we've, I, I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas, so I've been really focused on investing in my backyard. Yeah, I, I think that's the best approach too. just uh, where you can go out and, um, and see the property, make sure that it's uh, uh, just make sure that it's clean, it's functional, and uh, it's a great place to live. And you can't really do that when the properties are a flight away, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially if you're on the, the, the come up, you're, you're learning from experiences. If it's in your backyard. Um, you can just kind of see how people, other people treat the property and, and know what those experiences are like when, I mean, the same things that are going to happen to the property, whether it's in your, your backyard or a uh, flight away. So it kind of helps, helps you hedge against the unknown, mm -hmm. but, um, tell us about the, uh, the property that just sold, how you found it, how you financed it, um, how you performed on it. And then, um, just, uh, how, how that looks. 
Yeah, so that one, we uh, I was actually just an LPN. So it was really how I got my feet wet in the syndication space, I guess. And I highly recommend that being a first step for people who are looking to get into the syndication space. Uh, you know, a lot of people, I know for me, I was a teacher with not much money. So I was trying to figure out how to, I, I had something and I was able to sell the property to, to use some of that money to roll over into this one. But, um, you know, I, a lot of people get it, look at the syndication space and they're like, oh, I can find a way to get in deals with none of my own money, which is true. But I really like the idea of starting as a limited partner and just investing with another seasoned uh, general partner, uh, asset management group, seeing how they do. And the deal did fine. You know, I know it went through some uh, hiccups of, you know, just insurance costs went through the roof. I think it was originally going to be a six year a hold and it ended up being a three year hold. We got our money back and uh, a little extra on top of that. So it wasn't a killer deal by any means, but it did help me to learn the process, seeing people do it their, their way of the monthly investor reports, how they handle, uh, you know, if the property isn't performing well, what they're doing. Uh, what you could, the, well, you let's could, start from the beginning yeah. though on this. How did you find the deal? How did you get involved in the deal? Because there, there's a lot of dots we need to connect for the audience. So how, how can they go and yeah, find so this, a deal to be a limited partnership in? This was flat out from Zoom real estate meetups. Okay. I had met people and there's one Zoom meetup that I would go to all the time. It'd be on Fridays and you would get into these small breakout rooms. So I think people may think of Zoom meetups and they think of one person talking to, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 people. Well, this, the way they did this Zoom meetup would, was, uh, you know, however many people would join and then it would break up into small, small, like four to five small group rooms or whatever you want to call it. And you'd be in there. It's almost like speed dating real estate. And you're seeing who's interested in what, who's investing where, who needs help with what, learning from different people's experience and just kind of got to know some people over time. And they would promote their deals that, they had started to uh, pursue and needed investors for. And I like the underwriting went to their, uh, their zoom meetup for, for investors going over that. But that, that's how I got in, in touch with those uh, uh, general partners to find that deal. Cause I was in Georgia. So that was the first one and I'm in Arkansas. So that was the first time I'd ever invested one outside of the state, but two where I wasn't really hands on because I like to be hands on with, with whatever my investment is. But uh, so it, 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 I, I gave a small amount. Another thing I would recommend to people, if you're going to be a limited partner, don't start big. You know, if, if you got 50,000 to invest, see if you can just invest 25. What you know, part of uh, Georgia was this in? Augusta. Augusta. What, what year did you, what was this investment? So that's, this one was 2021 when I got invested in it. Okay. All right. It was, uh, prices were hiked up pretty good then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was a loan assumption. So I think there's more capital that was raised, but, uh, it, Augusta, Georgia in general, pretty, pretty good area to invest. And then I know insurance costs definitely spiked a little bit and that hurt. And then the occupancy never really got to, you know, 92 plus. It was kind of hovering in the mid eighties quite a bit, but you know, so it went through some dingers, but I think it's unreal. I think a lot of people get into real estate and think, Oh, just because you invest, it's automatically going to go well. And I think it's, I think this is a really good learning experience just to see, okay, it didn't quite hit the numbers that we wanted to, but everyone got the money back. Everyone's happy. They got a little bit of returns you know, especially in a time where I know there's a lot of extra capital calls going on right now. And so it, it, it was a good deal for me to be in and learned a lot from it. And it's kind of good just timing overall. But yeah, 2021 is when it started. And uh, I, it, it wasn't a super high price per door by any means. I mean, the underwriting was pretty conservative with a lot of their costs. And then some of the insurance stuff came out of the blue, which I know really, you know, hunkered up or the expenses. Where's the uh, did the general partnership were they self managing or relying on third party? Relying on third party, and I know they had done that with two different property managers, and then they started to manage it themselves. So they got involved, and I don't know, I don't know all the intricate details there. But for me, as an investor, when I see people doing that, to me, they're hustling, and that's all. That's all I really want to know. You know, if if we went from fifteen percent to ten percent return that's okay. I just want to know that people are really, you know, 
protecting the money, protecting the invest investment, looking at it like their own, and really just hustling to try and make the deal as as good as it could possibly be. Yeah, I, I think that's the key is is um, having a GP general partnership that is uh, operating the deal too, and and I mean like boots on the ground daily operating it. Because a lot of times you can have those those daily stand up calls, and then after the call, uh, everyone disperses, and everything right. in the meeting that was going over just completely evaporates. So yeah. it's being able to keep the foot on the pedal, apply pressure at all times, and make sure that the property is producing what it should be. Because you're in you're in direct control, you can right. uh, pull different levers. Mm -hmm. um, occupancy, I think, is a direct reflection of that as well. Because there there's so many misses in the operations on a daily basis. Uh, just by simple follow-up and follow-through. Um, leads can be coming in, but are they being managed? Are they being followed up? Are notes being done? Are we calling back? Are we scheduling appointments? There's so many operational inefficiencies that if you don't have these these little in-between scenarios taken care of, it just you can see where it can it can hurt the performance of the property. Right. Um, and I believe you're an operator as well, correct? Correct. So our biggest one in Central Arkansas, we have is a 30 unit. So it's not quite 127, but it's it's a 30 unit. So we don't have a full, you know, payroll person. But yeah, I mean, with this one, I mean, like you said, you can get into these meetings and people disperse and do their own thing. Who's actually going to the property? I don't know, checking on the contractors, whatever it is. And so, you know, I I, I basically a side hustle really is being a general contractor because I got my own my own subs for everything. I've learned bad subs through hard lessons. And so it, it's really helped after being in real estate for kind of four years now that I have all these connections and contacts. And so I send, I take care of all the maintenance stuff, or I don't do the maintenance work, but I have my maintenance people do all the maintenance stuff, um, you know, all the unit turns, things like that. So the property manage, manager, I want them just focused on uh, renting uh, units, getting applicants, renewals, you know, their, their due diligence there. But then I think a misconception with people getting into real estate, real estate is a business. You don't just get into real estate. Even if the property manager is great, you're, you still have to manage the manager as in any business. The, like you, you want to set your expectations and it's your job to make, make sure that those happen. It's not, a lot of people just want to blame the property managers. And I think a lot of you know, people get into real estate and maybe they don't have business or entrepreneurship background in any sort of capacity. They think, oh, you just give it. If they're not doing a good job, you just get rid of them, find a new one. Sometimes you have to lead them and sometimes you have to set your expectations, follow through. OK, what's our pipeline look like? You know, we had these leads maybe a year ago. Do we still have those leads? Can we follow up with those up oh, the Facebook marketplace photos? Those aren't quite up to our standards. Let's get a little bit better on those. You know, maybe it's training them how to teach and talk to certain residents. You know, there's some residents I've I've had to, you know, help the property manager kind of properly talk to and, and things like that. So you still have to learn to manage the manager. But, yeah, I'm, I'm all over kind of having my hands inside the deal. I'm, I'm at the property a couple times a week for sure. Just uh, managing the manager, checking on the turn, the turnovers and whatever needs to happen. And then just kind of seeing what the vibe of the property is. What are, what are residents saying? You know, they think I'm with management, but you know, I'll go around, Hey, how's everything going on here? You know, anything I need to know about and your, your fingerprints are all over it. So uh, I, I think that's important for people to really understand that they need to do if they get involved in real estate. Uh, tell us about the authority unit. How'd you find it? How did, uh, um, how did you t uh, acquire it and, uh, and start running it and managing it? Sure. So this one was 2022. We closed this one, got it at a great price per door. I knew the area well because I grew up like a block from it. And so it was B class at a C class price. And I knew we could do standard, you know, maintenance, uh, you know, turns, little things. You didn't have to do much to really get it to where it needed to be. It overwhelmingly met kind of the 1% rule. I know some people don't look at that as much in commercial real estate, but I still like to peek at that. But uh, so we, we found that it actually came on the market, uh, like Zillow. And the day it came out, I called my partner who lives in DC. I was like, this is a great price per door. I'm driving there right now. It was a Sunday. I remember. Was, and so I drove there and checked on the property. I was like, yeah, we need to, we need to pursue this one quick. And so I think we got it under con contract, like 
the next day or two and then did some renegotiating from there and um you know got it at like shoot what was it uh 58,000 per door which was a great spot for for this area and then this is a joint venture deal so we just kind of had some and there's not too many investors in it i think it's 7 total and we raised the 550,000 600,000 uh dollars of capital needed and got to actually a, a loan from a local lender here that we liked and yeah about to come up on 2 years owning that and it it's taken a little bit longer for i've i've definitely learned some lessons of what i would do differently if i could go back i mean the property's fine but um you know there could have been some ways to quicker more quickly uh, stabilize the property to really get it fully occupied with the right people, you know, get rid of the headache tenants that were there before that wanted to try to do things their way. You know, I was, I was too merciful with them to start, you know, you listen to some of those stories sometimes and people could say they're going to pay. And so I just kind of learned those lessons. And um, then the eviction process would be a little bit annoying of how long that would take. Cause there's only what two people in our County that were, that were doing it. And so uh, you just learn a lot of the lessons that way. But yeah, we bought it at a good price. And our goal is to long-term hold things, but we'll, we'll see what we want to do here because we, we definitely bought it at a pretty good price per door and um, could definitely make some money selling it in the five-year or less time frame. But yeah, that, yeah, we actually found that one on market. Awesome. So are you going to refinance your partners out? They make their money on their money and, and uh, keep it forever? Or what's the, um, just sell it and move on? We've thought about that, but I don't think at a ref I don't think we'd be able to fully do that at a refinance. I, this could be a this could be a sell and move on. We'll we'll see. I mean, I I always tell the partners in the group. I mean, we're just a team, so you know, we've got to figure out what works for everybody. And um, but my goal generally with real estate is to buy and hold as long as you can. I mean, I look at I look at stuff of like, man, if you own something for 20 years, I mean, just look at how much it's appreciated or where, however long, I mean, let alone cash flows. And I think a lot of people, you know, you start looking at three to five year holds. And to me, that's just like flipping properties and finding a good deal is hard. And so if you're flipping properties, that becomes a full time job, uh, you know, and, and so I like the buying and hold aspect if it's possible and if it's the best fit. But I don't think a refinance would cover enough of the cost to be able to buy everyone out. So I don't know that that'll be our play. And I know I've got one partner who really wants to do something like that. And um, we'll see if he gets creative and how he wants to do that. But that's kind of in the works. What are you uh, What are you seeing on the Delta from in place rents to where you all are pushing them to? So we haven't really super aggressively pushed rents because we haven't really needed to. We just really needed to get it occupied with good tenants paying on time. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're, we're not the bottom of our area in the market, but you know, we're, we're a competitive one bedroom. So I think, you know, I mean, we, the one bedrooms will, will push probably about 725 and then five and five pest and trash, 35 water, and then 12 for renter's insurance. And then the two bedrooms, they can go for closer to 800, depending on the size. We have kind of a variable size of units, but, yeah, 800, even 850, we've been able to get with two bedrooms. Um, and so that just kind of depends on what some of the upgrades are in each of them and the size of the unit. But that's more or less what we're pushing to, which is not by any means, you know, even, even, I mean, there's definitely one bedrooms that are, are two bedroom rates and two bedrooms that are a thousand dollars. So we've definitely got room that we can improve and grow, but there's something to be said I think about just when you have good, good residents there, just keep them. I mean, there's something to be said about that when there's no headache, even if it's $50 less per year. Okay. We're talking, you know, $600 for, and I, I, I did see a study at one point and this has always resonated with me. It is 10 times cheaper to keep a client than to lose one and go find a new one. And I think of that with kind of real estate. It is so much cheaper if you can find a good resident keep them there, even if it's a little bit cheaper than to have to vacate the unit. Maybe you have to do some unit turn work. Then you got to spend on the marketing. If you got to, if you got to do that, hopefully you have a pipeline full of people that are just ready to come, but that may not be the case. And then you move someone in, they pass all your requirements, but even still 
something happens. I mean, we had someone who recently they passed all the requirements, the checklists of they made the rent to income ratio or income to rent ratio. They pass a background check, all this different stuff. They move in two months later. They're gone. They moved out. No, no 30 days notice, no nothing. So obviously we chase them for that money. But, you know, this is someone that was new and come in, they checked off all the boxes. And so something that I've learned is there, there's just something to be said about someone who is just a really good tenant. They've been there a long time. There's never any issues, <laughs> you know, because and, and, a lot of people want to get into real estate and not have headache. And sometimes you may take a slight pay cut to not have that headache. But man, for me, that is what I've learned. Maybe I'm alone in that, but it has been highly worth it. Yeah, I think the LPs can sign on with no headache, but uh, the owner operator, that's going to go wherever you go. No matter <laughs> right. what business it's in, the, uh, the headaches will be there. People, the, the, uh, it's just, it, it is what it is. It's being in the mm -hmm. driver's seat, managing and maintaining uh, operations. Uh, how are you copying your rents? That seems pretty low for the one and two bedrooms. Yeah, so we, we call other properties around us just to see what they're at. And, you know, you can see stuff online as well. But uh, again, we bought at a good price to where we don't have to aggressively really push these things. Um, and so, you know, our one bedrooms, we can probably maybe get 10% higher in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, it has been harder. It's taken longer and our managers, you know, they, they have a lot of, they have a lot of assets throughout the state and different, different states, but they've told us just in general right now, it, it has taken longer to, uh, get vacated units rented. And so we're, we're totally fine with, I, I think, I mean, the economy is not in great shape. I, I sure the stock market's up, things like that, but the people that are not making as much money, their margins are very slim. And so you, you see that as well. And, and we're, I think, you know, if you know that you're cash flowing and, you know, you don't have to be so much higher to really be able to make the perf the property perform the way you want to and you just need the occupancy, then I don't we're not really just trying to aggressively push the rent or anything like that. We're we're comfortable with where we're at and uh, with the cash flow. And then as a unit comes available, my, my first goal is occupancy. So we're at like. 87, 90% occupied right now. I want to see if I can hit hundred percent. I want to get those things full first before I really start to push the rents in another unit. Uh, it, it is, is my take. I don't want to push, you know, say there's three, four vacant units. I, I want to wait until I'm kind of one unit and maybe this is just me being conservative. I want to wait till there's kind of one unit to really try and push it because then your occupancy is still pretty high and kind of covering those expenses, so to speak. And, and so that, that's that's where we're at. But it is definitely not the highest in the area, but we just call other, other properties and see where they're at for, for their rents. Got it. What, what kind of finishes are you putting inside the units? For the most part, we got new floors. We'll put some fresh coat of paint on there, new light fixtures, uh, you know, paint the doors and give some new appliances. But we don't always need new countertops. We don't need new cabinets. Uh, what else have we done? Those are really the main things. And then we've got some exterior appeal that we've done just from painting some different areas on the exterior. We're going to paint all the doors, add some new exterior light fixtures. But the, those are the main things. So it it's really pretty standard stuff. We're not going in and gutting the unit. Uh, we're, you know, it's throw some LVT floor down there, paint the walls if you need it, which you generally do. Uh, I've learned that, that has helped a lot because I've tried to not do it and get away with it. And it didn't work as well as painting it. It looks much, much better for, for your advertising. And then, yeah, yeah your, your standard light fixtures. I, I think just fresh paint with the, with the, uh, electric outlet plates and light fixtures really make a place pop that, that makes it look a, a world of difference. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. We, um, we like to reface the cabinets with uh, at least new doors, give a new color scheme, granite countertops, designer plumbing fixtures. Just make it um, a little bit on a different level above the rest. That way you can get those premium, the premium rents and it helps push up the market and helps you secure the longer term tenants and paying a little bit more. But um, it all depends on the market, too. It's surrounding properties, right. what the uh, the market uh, deems fit. So um, so what's next on your agenda and the uh, the future of your real estate journey? Yeah. So, uh, 
we're we're gonna we're not actively shopping right now. I still want to. I like not over leveraging my time, <laughs> so, and, and because I have plenty of other little things that I'm that I'm doing and enjoying. But we'll look to buy some more when we find a good deal. We've loved our Airbnb stuff that we've been doing. We have a 14 unit kind of boutique hotel. That that was a full on gut job, and that was an interesting process there. But uh, that one we. Uh, it's in Hot Springs, Arkansas, kind of a vacation touristy area doing really well, especially in the summer. And so we like that. And my brother and I, we've always been drawn to kind of some vacation rental type of things. And so we've got our, you know, different duplexes and fourplexes and single family houses in, in Little Rock as well. But we may look at even selling some of those and getting in more into the vacation rental space because if we can find one property that cash flows as much as eight of our properties, then that is way more worth it. And, you know, we did some different things with different loans starting out to where we really had to do very little with our own money, which was, which was good. But, you know, if I could go back, I'd, I'd put a little bit more towards the debt so you can make the cash flow that much easier. You know, the, the operations, that much less stressful and, and things like that. I think it really opens up what you can do. And so we'll, yeah, we'll look to buy, but I don't mind buying small stuff. I know a lot of people are really big into the economy of scale and things like that. But my two cents for people starting out is I like starting small because for my podcast, I have a financial literacy podcast and I always talk, you know, a lot of pe young people are scared to get invested, especially in real estate. They're like, what, what if something happens? What, what, you know, all these things that can go wrong. And I just tell them to call it tuition. So if you're getting in, get a single family house and rent it and get, you know, have extra cash. I know Mark Cuban always talks about that. A lot of entrepreneurs start out and he recommends having your credit card debt paid off and then have extra cash, have extra reserves for anything that can go wrong. Give yourself a year to figure it out. I think it takes three years to really learn any, any business. But, you know, if you're starting out, get involved in a small property and if something happens wrong, you know, the AC went out and it, the property inspection, I don't know, it was, it was a bad one, you know, or something happens with the roof and you have to pay $5,000 to get something fi fixed. Change your perspective of, oh, I lost money to, oh, that's just tuition. Because if you're learning anything in life, you generally have to pay tuition. If you're going to college, you pay tuition much, much more than a $5,000 roof fix, whatever it is. And so that's why I like starting smaller because your tuition payment isn't as bad, but you're really learning a lot of the same lessons and you're finding some of the same contractors. You know, if you need contractors, go to Home Depot at 7 a.m. in the morning. You're going to find plumbers. You're going to find electricians. You're going to find whoever you need. And then you don't have to go to general contractor and pay them extra 25% just to use their electrician. You know, and so you're, you're going to find these different people that you can get involved in. And so you're learning the game that way. And then you kind of slowly build your portfolio. And if you want to pursue bigger than single families and duplex and fourplexes, that's fine. Go for it. But I like learning those small lessons first. And so I really think we're going to get back to some of those basics for us, because even in having these 30 and 14 units, we don't have that much equity in them. And so I like having full control of something. I like having, you know, me and my brother partnering 50, 50 or a hundred, or maybe I get some hundred percent equity and uh, attacking it that way. And so we might even look to go backwards here and go smaller and buy up some different areas. I had a real estate mentor tell me, you know, if you're starting out, focus on a street, focus on a neighborhood. And, you know, you've you got your multifamily zone pockets in whatever city, focus on those and flip the whole. And when you buy those and renovate those, you're flipping the whole area. And, and so that's what I think we're actually going to lean towards focusing on. And then if we, and, and if we find some sort of vacation rental in the meantime, then we'll attack that. I think that's really going to be further down the road though, because it's going to require more capital. Um, and we'd really like to do stuff ourselves rather than having a, a lot of partners. That's just our take. Cause I know that that is not the normal take for a lot of real estate people, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of move backwards and really kind of start smaller with, um, some of the other things, just adding to duplexes, adding to fourplexes and, uh, just finding good little deals out there like that. Cause there, there's plenty of them. Yeah, that is true. Very cool. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, learn more about you and, uh, and, uh, see if they can find deals with you, how can they, how can they reach out? 
Yeah, so I don't mind giving my email, Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, at Berryhill, R-E-I, realestateinvesting.com. And not <laughs> Berryhill, B-E-R-R-Y-H-I-L-L-R-E-I.com. Or you can follow our podcast. I love doing our podcast. It's growing. Almost 5,000 followers on TikTok. I haven't really even done anything, but you never know. Some videos just find some viewers. But you can follow the podcast, uh, Money Vision U, like university, on all podcast platforms. And it's on TikTok and Instagram. And it's really for... It, it, I, I call it the financial class you should have had in high school. That's the tagline of it. So it's not just real estate focused. Talk breaks down the five different asset classes, has a CPA come on and he breaks down the pay, the, the taxes in a paycheck. So it's really aimed at young adults, maybe 16 to 24 years old that are really just trying to get a grasp, grasp of the basics of financial literacy. I love doing that. It's a big hobby that I'd love to grow into something that can be monetized, but uh, that those are the ways you can find me and get a hold of me. Awesome. Cool. Stuart, I definitely appreciate your time today and I'll look forward to following you. Appreciate it.